All right, happy Saturday afternoon. Time to talk in a little bit more depth about the 49ers pre-Bucks roster moves. A couple of practice squad elevations. Temporary, these two players remain on the practice squad, but by NFL rule, they are part of the 49ers game day roster. It's a 48-man roster against Tampa Bay tomorrow. And that's Tevin Coleman, the running back, and Dante Johnson, the defensive back. Now, the Coleman elevation is most interesting, and we can talk about the potential downstream effects. With Tevin Coleman moving up, it's likely that one of the 49ers' previously active running backs will be inactive tomorrow, and that's almost certainly going to be Ty Davis Price, the rookie third-round pick out of LSU. So you're looking at a 49ers' backfield tomorrow of Christian McCaffrey, Jordan Mason, obviously Debo Samuel, he can do a little bit of something too, Tevin Coleman, and the odd man out is Ty Davis Price. And I think that it all signifies that Jordan Mason's role, which has only been growing, will continue to grow. Jordan Mason, three games ago, had four carries. Two games ago, had five carries. Last week, we saw Jordan Mason rack up eight carries. The role has only been grown for number 24, who reminds so many people of Marshawn Lynch. He's a big back, 223 pounds, but he's also got some burst to him. Came out of Georgia Tech system. Jordan Mason is an exciting player, and I think the 49ers need to utilize, utilize him more. I don't say that they've been underutilizing him. I think, as I just said, his role has been increasing from four to five to eight carries, and I think you're going to see Jordan Mason into double digits against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. With Tevin Coleman being called up, I think it's very likely that Coleman is being called up for special teams purposes. Jordan Mason has had a big role on special teams. So Tevin Coleman can take more of those special team snaps so that Jordan Mason can play more at running back. The 49ers obviously prefer, prefer Jordan Mason over Ty Davis Price. Those are their two big backs, right? They're two 220 pounders. Jordan Mason, a little bit heavier than Ty Davis Price. I think he's got a little bit more burst. And yes, he does run a little bit, but like Marshawn Lynch, he bruises defenses. But if Jordan Mason can get more running back carries, it eases things up for Christian McCaffrey because Christian McCaffrey's greatest value to the 49ers has clearly been in the pass game. He's been running routes out of the slot. He's been running wheel routes. He's been an outlet man at running back. His efficiency as a receiver is far greater than his efficiency as a running back, whereas I would argue the opposite for Jordan Mason. This guy is a tried and true running back. We haven't seen hardly anything of him in the past game, but we know that he can take a handoff and we know he can truck people. So if Jordan Mason gets more carries, and he has been getting more from four to five to eight over the past three games, if he continues upping that number, if Shanahan makes it somewhere over 10, that frees Christian McCaffrey up for more pass patterns. And it also shields Christian McCaffrey from potential injury. So I think it just makes most sense to assign players jobs that they're most effective at. And Jordan Mason is most effective at running the football. And Christian McCaffrey, especially now with a new quarterback, Brock Purdy is going to need that outlet option more often. Run Christian McCaffrey into the slot, shield him from some of those potential injuries. And I think that you have the best use of talent if you're the 49ers. The Dante Johnson elevation, by the way, if you want to talk about that one, that bolsters the 49ers secondary. 49ers have tremendous depth, right? I mean, if you can elevate players like Tevin Coleman and Dante Johnson from the practice squad on December 10th, late in the season, that's a testament to how strong of a roster that John Lynch has built. And obviously, Tevin Coleman can help the 49ers in special teams. By the way, special teams, number five unit over the past five weeks, 49ers, juggernaut filing on all, firing on all cylinders. You can elevate him just for the special team's value. That's great. And then obviously he's depth in case McCaffrey and or Jordan Mason go down in this game. But Dante Johnson, that's more depth. I mean, this is a defensive back who could play safety, who could play nickelback who can play outside cornerback, did a great job against the Packers, starting at outside cornerback, and Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams last year in the playoffs. You want a body like that ready for this game against Tom Brady and company. These guys have three really talented receivers who have accomplished a lot in this league. The Buccaneers have Julio Jones. They have Mike Evans. They have Chris Godwin. It's not a bad thing to have another versatile defensive back 
in the rotation. And that's what Dante Johnson is for the 49ers. But I think most people are focused on the Tevin Coleman news. And I think it means that Jordan Mason's role is only going to be growing. Let me visualize this for you. This is the 49ers depth chart. Obviously, players in pink on the left side here are hurt, may not play. We know Jimmy Garoppolo certainly won't play. Hassan Ridgeway certainly won't play. And Tarvarius Moore certainly won't play. Nick Bosa is currently questionable. But neither of those four guys is on injured reserve because the 49ers only have two return from IR spots left. So they're being stingy with placing players on IR. You can see the elevations that they've made have actually come at positions where the injury situation is not horrid. But Dante Johnson highlighted here in yellow as an elevation. Well, Tarverius Moore's got that sprained knee. So Dante Johnson, I think, is the 49ers reserve safety in this situation. Instead of Tarverius Moore, they're going to use Dante on special teams. Tarverius was a big, big special teams contributor for the 49ers. So expect Dante Johnson to see a big role in that regard. Nobody hurt in that running back room, but Tevin Coleman's elevated, which makes me think that Ty Davis Price is going to be inactive tomorrow. So that's the situation. 49ers. Buccaneers, roster machinations, all fascinating, some nuanced, some will tell us more than other ones, but uh, that's what we know so far about what the 49ers are going to do against Tampa Bay tomorrow. All right, my 49ers Tampa Bay prediction is coming up a little bit later, so be sure to stay tuned for that. Like this video, subscribe to the channel so you're ready for the prediction. And hey, it's Saturday afternoon. Everybody's in a good mood. It's about 3.30 p.m. on the West Coast. I think I'll answer some questions. Yes, smash that like button. Mike says, listen to Mike. Mike's a great guy. Makes really good thumbnails, too. Red Eye says, Mike Evans is 6'5". Need a tall corner to cover him. Sherman, 6'3". Would have been good back in his prime. Yeah, but I don't know if the 49ers are going to start Dante Johnson just because Mike Evans is 6'5". I think that Dante Johnson's aboard for safety and cornerback and nickelback depth. If Brady starts throwing up fade passes to... Mike Evans, the 49ers absolutely can't cover with their existing personnel, and that's Diometer Lenore, obviously starting off as a Charvarius Ward at cornerback. Yeah, maybe if there's so much bleeding that you just are desperate to stop it, maybe you do plug Dante Johnson in there, but I don't think that he's going to be used in that kind of fashion. The, yeah, I do think the Bucks' safeties are going to miss this game. Mike Edwards, Antoine Winfield. They're both doubtful. Doubtful means they're probably going to miss this game, which means that the 49ers need to make some hay over the middle of the field. Now, we know that it's raining here in the Bay Area, a lot of rain here in the Bay Area. So I don't know exactly what the percentage chances are going to be post 1 p.m. tomorrow, but that might hurt the passing games for both teams. And generally, rain is going to help the team that's a little bit weaker in terms of the passing game, right, as far as their chances to win the football game because it neutralizes things. So I think rain might be a good thing for the 49ers in this football game because the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have Tom Brady and the 49ers are going to start a third string quarterback in Brock Purdy. The Buccaneers also have the number 30 rated run offense in the NFL. I know the 49ers run game hasn't been very good this year, but it's better than number 30. And if it's a rain game, that run offense is going to be a big deal. Yeah, I am tall enough to cover Mike Evans. I'm 6'5 and a half. So I'll just play some physical press coverage over at the line of scrimmage and 49ers will be fine in this game tomorrow. Let me put up my 49ers Buccaneers preview onto the screen here for you guys. Maybe we could talk a little bit about my driverless car experience yesterday as well because that was a lot of fun. Here we go. 49ers Buccaneers. Brock Purdy's starting debut against Tom Brady's greatness. These Saturday afternoon shows always surprise me. A lot of you like to watch them. And when I see a lot of people watching, then I go ahead and stay aboard for a little bit longer. So we got 250 people on. We've been on for nine minutes. It's perfect. Uh, if you want to check this article out, we've got a lot of analytics, a lot of deep dives into 49ers bucks. I'm putting this into the comment section. Yesterday, fittingly, it wasn't planned, I swear. I went to a bar in San Francisco called The Buccaneer. We joined for part of a pub crawl. Some of the Irish people, the Irish contingent in San Francisco, they do their 12 pubs of Christmas, which I guess is a tradition in Ireland. They do it in San Francisco. They start in the marina. They go through Russian Hill. They cut down to Lower Polk, just kind of moving in that L shape. And 
about halfway through one of the bars they stopped at. I was invited to join for a couple of the bars. So I was invited to join for all of them, but I'm not going to do 12. Um, I, I joined at the, at the Buccaneer, which back in the day, I'm not sure if it's still the case, back in the day was the New England Patriots bar in the upper city. The official New England Patriots bar is called the Connecticut Yankee. That's in Portrero Hill. I believe the Patriots are playing. Are they playing Monday Night Football here coming up? Anyway, they're, at some point here, they have a primetime game coming up. If you want to watch at the Patriots bar, see what Boston people are all about, go to the Connecticut Yankee. But the Buccaneer, which is modeled like a pirate ship, the inside of a pirate ship, that also used to be a Pats bar because I don't really think there's any Tampa Bay Buccaneer fans outside of Tampa Bay. What a missed opportunity though if there are more tampa fans outside of tampa bay they could make the buccaneer literally a bar named after their team into their team bar in san francisco how likely do i think it is that nick bosa plays uh true toss up for me 50 50 if he does play maybe you see a little bit of a ease up on the snap count from nick bosa i'm not sure i do know the 49ers have a game on sunday and then they have a quick turnaround and a game on thursday against the Seattle Seahawks. So it's a situation where you have to realize that game against Seattle is more important toward the standings, but both of these games are important. And I think Nick Bosa is sitting there saying, I want to sack Tom Brady. This might be my last chance to sack the GOAT, Tom Brady, right? I mean, th this is a great opportunity for Nick Bosa. So I would imagine he is fighting or lobbying to play. But if the hamstring's a bit of an issue, 49ers have to be smart with it because that Seattle game on Thursday night is more important. What is the biggest concern for the 49ers defense? Well, Tom Brady's quick release. He gets the ball out in 2-4-4. And if the 49ers aren't on their P's and Q's coverage-wise, he can carve them up just like he carves anybody up that's not on their P's and Q's coverage-wise. So I would say that. I would say that Tom Brady's quick release is a big concern. 49ers have to make sure they cover the backs coming out of the backfield. Brady loves to go to those guys. So stop that. Obviously, the receivers are talented. Stop them in the short game or at least dissuade Brady from dipping into that well too many times. And then even if you don't have Nick Bosa, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are not good along the offensive line and pass protection because of injuries. No Ryan Jensen at center. No Tristan Wirfs at right tackle. Even with no Bosa, the 49ers should be able to get some pressure in this game. Now, no, not having Bosa is a big disadvantage for the 49ers if that ends up being the case. But just keep in mind that the pass rush won't matter unless the 49ers don't uh, unless the 49ers cover. If they do cover, that's when they can start making some hay up front against Tampa Bay. And I think they'd be able to, even if Nick Bosa doesn't play. Michael Hornbach asks, will the 49ers get any sacks on Tom Brady? I think they will. I think they'll get at least one. I think they need more than one though to win this game. I think you need two to win this game. That's just a spitball prediction for me. Appreciate it though, Michael. And Brady gets rid of the ball very quickly. Fastest in the NFL. Doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes. But the Bucks do have some holes on their offensive line. And the 49ers defense has been playing well enough to where, yeah, I'll say they'll get at least a sack on Tom Brady. Maybe two sacks in this game, even though he gets that ball out really, really fast. Arturo, thank you. Proposed starting line, if Nick Bosa doesn't play, well, starting line doesn't matter nearly as much as the rotation. I mean, they're going to they're gonna play seven, eight guys in this rotation. But I think you put Ebukam and Amenahu on the edges, and then obviously Eric Armstead is going to be lining up on the inside for the 49ers. Those are going to be your big three with more action for Drake Jackson, who's been really good at tipping some of those passes for the 49ers. All right, more questions, guys. Let's see. Uh, well, the 49ers have a rotation of edge rushers, right? So if you have a rotation of edge rushers, then you just have to pick up the slack if Nick Bosa's out. This is a question asking who takes uh, Nick Bosa's spot if he rests on Sunday. So looking at the rotation of edge rushers, you have Sansa Mebicom, Charles Amenahu, and Drake Jackson behind and Jordan Willis too, but behind Nick Bosa. So all of those guys have to carry a little bit more of the load to pick up the slack. Action Jackson, I love it. What a nickname. Do I have any fun stories about Christian McCaffrey during his Stanford days? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, Christian McCaffrey is not the most, you know, he's not going to give you the most salacious material. The guy sits down and works Chris Forster yesterday 
I think said it the best in this story. I could read you one for the 49ers days and then I'll get back to the Stanford days really fast. Chris Furster. Let's read this one. This is from the story, by the way, on the athletic. Christian, this is what Chris Furster said. Christian's awesome. I go up to congratulate him and Kyle Juszczyk. They're sitting on a cooler after the game. And I go to dab them up and say, hey, man, great job. Love you guys. And the first thing Christian does is stand up, look at me in the eyes. Serious as a heart attack. He goes, I miss too many today. I promise I'll get better. I prom I missed some holes and I left too much out there. I won't let you guys down again. Just give me time. Be patient with me. And then Chris Forster's like, Christian, relax, man. We're winning. We won the game. We'll get to work next week and correct our errors. But the dude is serious-minded. He wants to be absolutely perfect in everything he does. Stanford story about Christian McCaffrey for you that's related to the, the one that Chris Furster just illustrated. I mean, that's that's a great, great encapsulation of Christian McCaffrey's competitive personality. But Stanford would have these death pulls they would do in, in their training where two guys would uh, be connected to each other. You'd have a belt on and a rope would be connected to the two guys. And uh, each guy would have to run in an opposite direction. And whoever was stronger and whoever had more guts and more endurance would win. You'd try to break your opponent's will. And uh, you know, anybody who's ever done a tug of war probably understands how hard this would be because it's only you and another guy and you're not tugging, you are sprinting the other way. So you're trying to break your competition's will. Christian McCaffrey, uh, you know, did not lose this this tug of war. He He would beat people very, very regularly. Back then, Stanford's strength coach was named Shannon Turley. And the way that Turley described it to me was awesome. He said that Christian McCaffrey would beat people so bad in these in these polls. I, I call them death polls. They're not really the name, but probably make you feel like death. But not only would he beat them, he would literally, you know, finish. You know, the other guy would be dragging. He'd, he'd fall down and Christian would be running. Okay, he, he wins. Christian McCaffrey would get back up, run over, put the guy back in position because there'd be another rep to go. And he'd help the guy that he just beat get back in position just so he could kick his ass again. So he'd go help the guy that he beat get back in position just so he could beat him again. The guy was a complete machine. And if it was somebody else's turn, Christian McCaffrey would put the belt on somebody else. He would help him get ready just so he could kick your ass again. This guy, Nick Bosa, is a machine built to rush the passer. Christian McCaffrey is a machine built to kick your ass. That's, that's the long and short story of Christian McCaffrey training at Stanford. So if you want an exciting story about Christian McCaffrey, that's it right there. That's how he's wired. That's, uh, I think, really related to the story that Chris Furster shared. Trying to sh celebrate a victory on the 49ers sideline, trying to congratulate the running back, the O-line coaches, and Christian McCaffrey gets up serious as a soldier and says, you know, sorry, coach, I missed this, I missed that. We're going to be better. I want to line those guys up and kick their ass again. So Christian McCaffrey is the type of player that I think the 49ers really enjoy having on their football team. Bully, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, he, he's a bully. He's, he's serious. And, you know, Stanford played bully ball back in the day. I know that things have changed. They just hired a new coach, Troy Taylor, today. Uh, we'll see how they play with Troy Taylor, the former Sac State coach. Uh, ran an explosive offense there. That was a crazy game. He gets incarnate word last night. I was following the score on Twitter while I was out. But, um, you know, bully ball was Stanford's identity earlier in their run from Harbaugh to obviously that transition to the David Shaw era. That's when Christian McCaffrey was there. Um, and, and he definitely took a lot of that mentality and combined it with his shifty running approach. Right. So that's that, that's what makes Christian McCaffrey so great is that he does both. He eludes you, but he also destroys you. He is so intensely focused on the task at hand because he is a machine built to kick your ass. And uh, it was a lot of fun to cover him at Stanford and obviously full circle for me when he came back to the 49ers. Sac State Hornets in the house. Say what's up to, I think his name is supposed to be a play on Mace Windu, a Star Wars character played by Samuel L. Jackson. I like that. Um, all right, let's get some questions up on the board. Who will be the right guard for the 49ers? Are they both ready to go? I'm going to guess they're going to keep on running their rotation because they are both ready to go. So Spencer Burford, but I don't know. Um, 
obviously Burford hadn't been available with the ankle sprain, but he's ready to go now. So Burford and Daniel Brunskill continue the Burford and Brunskill law firm along with Brendel and Banks. I mean, that's a, it's a robust law firm. The 49ers have up there. They've been doing a good job this season. The Stanford offensive linemen were high IQ bullies. Yeah, it reminds me of back in the day they had David DeCastro went on to play for the Steelers. He was a bully. He was a bully at that guard position for the 49ers or for the for the Stanford Cardinal back in the day. All right, questions, guys. Do I believe that the 49ers can pass the Eagles and the Vikings? It's going to be really tough. Vikings, maybe Eagles. Once the Eagles got away with that game against the Colts, they, I mean, I thought the Eagles should have lost that game against Jeff Saturday and the Colts. Once they got away with a win in that football game, to me, the math just didn't add up. The Eagles only have one loss. The most realistic scenario and even the best case scenario for the 49ers at this point might be the number three seed, which would get you a home playoff game. You wouldn't get the bye, but if you can lock up the number three sooner, rather than later, then you can use the end of the season to rest guys, which would be a massive benefit entering the playoffs. That's why the team that gets that first round by has such a higher probability. But you can close that gap. You can create a little bit of neutralization to the first round by advantage if you lock up your own playoff seating a little bit early. So 49ers can only beat who's in front of them. They can't really worry about the Eagles and the Vikings. I think they're better than the Vikings for sure. I think the 49ers profile is very similar to the Eagles. Just make sure that you don't have a potential matchup with the Eagles until the NFC Championship game. Knock them out in that situation or let somebody else knock them out before you when you talk about playoff positioning. No, Spencer Burford has not given up a sack this year to answer this question. Neither is Aaron Banks. It's been one of the major stories for the 49ers this season. You know, don't worry about this. You know, there's a thought here that Christian McCaffrey is putting too much pressure on himself. Christian McCaffrey is an all-pro. Should have won the Heisman at Stanford. Has been an all-pro in the NFL. The, he's part of the 99 club, right? The, the the Madden rating. Guy knows exactly what he's doing. He His his mentality works for him. He's a superstar. Don't worry about Christian McCaffrey's mentality. He's not putting too much or too little pressure on himself. I think it's a, that's just him. He, Like I said, he's a robot. He's a machine built to kick your ass when he steps out onto that football field or onto the practice field, and the 49ers are benefiting from that right now. The 49ers, I mean, definitely have a better chance of getting the number two seed than the number one seed. That's, I mean, Philadelphia's got a better record right now than Minnesota. Also, Minnesota's a worse team than Philadelphia. Minnesota's like a mediocre efficiency team that's won a ton of close games, has gotten a lot of good luck. I mean, think about the Josh Allen fumble on the quarterback sneak. Stuff like that has really helped the Vikings out, whereas Philadelphia is legitimately a two-way good team. I mean, Philadelphia is no joke, but neither are the 49ers. Neither are the Cowboys. Right now, it's a race between the Eagles, the Cowboys, and the 49ers to be the top contender in the NFC. But you can never forget about Mr. Brady, and the 49ers certainly won't this weekend because he's going to be in their house. Red Eye points out that precipitation is supposed to taper off at 1 p.m. in Santa Clara. Then the rain starts again at 4 p.m. Are the rain gods listening? Now, I think that rain might be in... Tampa's favor. They've got the better passer. They obviously have Tom Brady, right? So that could, you know, neutralize that effect. Tampa Bay's got a terrible run game. If it rains and teams have to lean more on the run game, the 49ers haven't been great, but they have a better run game than Tampa Bay. And if Nick Bosa doesn't play, well, that loss is not felt as hard if the the, the other team's not passing as much. So I wouldn't obsess too much about the rain. Both teams have to play in the, those conditions. I honestly don't think it would move the needle too far in either direction. But if there was a little bit of a, an advantage, it would be for the team that has the worst quarterback, right? And nobody's saying that Brock Purdy is better than Tom Brady. All right. Any more questions here? Let's go through all of them. You guys should hop on some people in the comment section and just beat the crap out of them. 
you should uh I, I I enjoy watching some of the fights in the in the in the comment section. You guys crack me up. Saturday. It's a more relaxed day. Let's see what people have. People are upset at Mike McGlinchey. I mean, McGlinchey didn't do anything wrong last game. I guess, you know, he's a below average pass blocker. You're not breaking any news by saying that. Uh, the sack last game that went around McGlinchey wasn't McGlinchey's fault. That was Brock Purdy's fault. So, I mean, I don't think right now is the time to be lighting Mike McGlinchey on fire. No, there is no thought to moving McGlinchey to guard. I mean, if you think he struggles in one-on-one pass blocking a tackle, what makes you think that he wouldn't struggle in one-on-one pass blocking a guard? The guy is on the lighter end. He's tall, too. The guards, you want a lower center of gravity because you're working against guys with a lower center of gravity at defensive tackle. Uh, McGlinchey, again, he's a really good run blocker. He's long. He gets out into space. That's why they like him at tackle. That length should presumably help the pass blocking a tackle. He has not been horrific pass blocking this year. He had a really bad game against the Chiefs. I want to look up Ma- Mike McGlinchey's pass blocking uh, productivity. I don't want to put PFF up on the screen, though, so I'm going to close that for you guys. I'm going to look it up right now. Let's see where uh, Mike McGlinchey's pass blocking productivity rating is just so we have some objectivity here. I check on this every few weeks. I haven't checked on it in a little while, so we will see. Uh, Go by position. And pass blocking for tackles. All right, what do you guys think Mike McGlinchey ranks in pass blocking efficiency out of... I'm going to tell you out of how many tackles here before you guys put in your guesses. There are 58 qualifying tackles. So where do you think the numbers put Mike McGlinchey out of 58? Get some good guesses in here and then I'll tell you. Waiting for some guesses. Out of 58 tackles, where does Mike McGlinchey rank in Pass block efficiency. This is going to combine sacks, pressures, quarterback hits allowed. We have one guess, 42. Another guess, 40th, 38th. One more guess. 48, 28, 34. Mike McGlinchey ranks number 31 out of 58 qualifying tackles in pass blocking efficiency. Should help us you know, with some context, right, in this situation. 58 qualifiers means that 29 is the median. 29 is right halfway. Mike McGlinchey is right under half. So he's a mediocre pass blocker. He's not horrifically bad. He's not good. He's not great. He ranks number 31. The strength of Mike McGlinchey is the run blocking. And that is the trade-off that Kyle Shanahan has been willing to embrace. If Mike McGlinchey can get on space and execute some of the difficult blocks that are necessary to execute in Kyle Shanahan's system, Kyle Shanahan is okay with Mike McGlinchey being a mediocre pass protector. Kyle Shanahan believes he could scheme around that. Now, is Kyle Shanahan right? TBD. I think the 49ers didn't have a good enough offensive line in 2019 to win the Super Bowl. That was obvious with most of the damage coming against right guard, but Mike McGlinchey struggling as well. And last year, they weren't good enough on the offensive line. A lot of injuries, but not enough depth. McGlinchey was one of those injuries. They have gotten better at pass protecting this season. That's really important to note. If you look at some of the composite pass protecting grades for the first time in the Shanahan era, the 49ers rank in the top 10. That's really big. That's really important. Mike McGlinchey's not terrible pass blocking. That's nice. Some of his low lights are tough to watch, but Number 31 out of 58, again, objectively not terrible. It is mediocre. So if the 49ers can work around that, and it's going to be harder now that Jimmy Garoppolo is not the quarterback, Brock Purdy, obviously is a rookie, so we'll see how he deals with pressure. But if they can work around that and play games on their terms, that means some play action. That means pounding people with the run after pass sets it up. Well, then Mike McGlinchey can relatively shine. But if the 49ers are playing from behind, 
If it's drop back, drop back, drop back against a defensive line with its ears pinned back, then Mike McGlinchey is not going to look good against bull rushes. So you have to set things up to play to his strengths, and it is what it is with Mike McGlinchey in that regard. Somebody thinks that Bosa will strong, strongly believes that Bosa will play this week. I'm not sure, man. We'll see. He's questionable at this point. So I think the 49ers are keeping in mind that they have a game on Sunday followed by a game on Thursday. Joe says, love from England. Go Niners. My boy, Debo. Sorry about the loss today in the World Cup, but you might be an American football fan, not a soccer fan. So maybe you don't need the apologies, but I'm sure that people in, in England are not, not too thrilled right now about how that went down, especially with the missed penalty kick. Yeah, this is it. His few failures are spectacular, not for news clips, for social media clips. Social media can be really toxic, right? You can find a negative play. You can amplify it. That's why it's important to look at the numbers because you could see plays represented on the aggregate so you understand the big picture because that's what the decision makers are going to go by. They're not going to go by people dunking on each other on Twitter. Joe does not need a reminding. He came here to forget about the soccer game today. But the 49ers can help you forget about it tomorrow. My question is, it's eight hours ahead time-wise in England versus San Francisco. So the 49ers are going to start one plus eight tomorrow. So they're going to start at 925, I think. Yeah, 925. So that's not too bad, right? For Joe, Joe gets to watch the game at 925. Now, do you watch at home or do you have a pub that you go to? Are there a lot of 49ers fans out there? Uh, these are all questions I want to know. I know Brady was out in Europe earlier this year in Munich, and now you get to watch a game from England on the West Coast eight hours ahead. I think that's going to be pretty cool. I haven't seen any viewers disappear yet, and I've been talking about soccer, so I don't know if your theory is correct. We have a prediction here, 49ers 27, Tampa Bay Buccaneers 17. My prediction is going to be coming a little bit later. I'm going to do it in a separate video, so stay tuned for that. I think I'm going to lean more toward the low scoring in this game. James thinks it's going to be 27-10, 49ers. It does suck for Joe when they play on Thursday night because five plus eight is 13, which is one about 1.15 a.m. It's a 1.15 a.m. start in, in England for the 49ers on Thursday night. Do I think the Seahawks will lose tomorrow? Uh, only if they're in a trap game mode, if they're looking ahead to the 49ers. But they play Carolina, don't they? Wouldn't expect Seattle to lose the Carolina. But, hey, if Seattle loses the Carolina and the 49ers beat the Buccaneers, then the 49ers, I believe, can clinch the NFC West with a win over Seattle on Thursday. So let's watch that closely because this could all escalate in a hurry. Isn't it wild to, to say the 49ers could be division champions less than a week from now? Like they could be. It's not likely, but they could be. The 49ers could be division champions less than a week from now if the right things break into their favor. I saw a 13 to 10 prediction. The 49-21 prediction seems a little bit wild. I don't know if anybody's putting up 49 points in this game. Not even sure if somebody puts up 21 if it's raining. Red Eye thinks that the 49ers need three wins, 11 and six, but maybe not if Seattle gets upset. Who knows? I think it's important for the 49ers to win just one game at a time. Take it one game at a time and you'll be okay. Sean says Mooney Ward should be matched up with Godwin. Godwin's Brady's number one target lately, not Evans. 49ers don't play much man. They didn't really do that against Miami. They're going to do a lot of zone. And I'm not sure if that's going to change. I think I think the coverage principles are what are important. You know, how far back are they? Some of the fits on the quicker pass game for Tampa Bay, because you have to dissuade Brady from releasing the ball in 2.44 seconds to allow that pass rush to get home. Yeah, I don't know. I think people are going to boo the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in general as they come out of the tunnel, but I don't know if Brady himself is going to get get booed in this game.
Joe checks back in. In England, American football doesn't get the support it deserves because people over here in England don't understand the rules. They say it's the worst version of rugby. They're so wrong. Rugby, to me, rugby is pretty entertaining to watch, but football, I, I get it that football is a descendant of rugby. You know, they, they come from the same tree, but football has grown so different, right? It is this highly choreographed. I mean, rugby just keeps on going. There are no plays in rugby, right? It's not, a, you don't huddle up and reline up. Football, you do though. And that is a big deal in football. All right, guys, 35 minutes. It's a good length show. I have a couple things to take care of. Thanks to Joe for his contributions from England. 49ers Buccaneers predictions coming later. Top of this show. Uh, by the way, I just talked about the 49ers elevations ahead of this Tampa Bay game. Tevin Coleman and Dante Johnson. I do think that Coleman is coming up for the 49ers to take Jordan Mason's special teams role because Jordan Mason's running back role has only been growing. Jordan Mason, three weeks ago, had four carries. Two weeks ago, had five carries. Last week, had eight carries. I think that gets up over 10 now with Tevin Coleman, you know, taking away some of his workload on special teams. And I think that's a good thing because Christian McCaffrey's greatest value is in the pass game, and Jordan Mason can free him up if he takes more handoffs. So all big stuff for the 49ers as you look at, you know, how they construct their backfield. Mason has been the rising gem this year, right? Christian McCaffrey was a great find, but McCaffrey is going to be needed more than ever as an outlet man for a new quarterback, the third stringer, Brock Purdy. So you talk about Marshawn Lynch running style from Jordan Mason. Well, you let him do that if you open up one of those spots on special teams. And I think the same thing applies to Dante Johnson, who could help take Tarvarius Moore's spot on special teams more obviously out with that knee sprain. So 49ers Buccaneers prediction coming later. This has been the roster update. Thank you for joining me. Make sure you hit that subscribe button to be online when I do come live with the prediction on Saturday evening. Everybody take care. Thanks for